Hey everyone, welcome to the video on the standard model of matter. The standard model of matter is a standardized definition and model that allows us to understand matter as well as fundamental forces. The model states that all matter consists of small elementary particles that exist either on their own or in combination or groups to form subatomic particles. The model also includes particles that mediate forces which interact with matter particles. This is a sample way of which you can visualize the standard model matter. There are two groups of particles we'll go through, the fermions, which are particles that make up matter, and the bosons, which are the particles that mediate the fundamental forces. In fermions, we've got quarks, as well as leptons. And in bosons, we've got different types of bosons, each of which mediates a particular fundamental force. Fermions are fundamental particles, otherwise known as elementary particles, that make up matter. The definition of fermions or elementary particles are particles that cannot be divided into smaller particles or smaller constituents. Examples of fermions include electrons, muons, and quarks, and these are different to subatomic particles. Electrons are classified as fundamental particles and subatomic particles. They are classified as fundamental particles because they cannot be broken down further and they are also classified as subatomic particles because they are found in an atom. Electrons are part of a group of fermions or fundamental particles called leptons. It is a first generation lepton and it is also the first fundamental particle discovered by Thomson and further characterized by other scientists down the road. In this diagram, there are six leptons you need to know, electron, muon, tau, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. Electrons and electron neutrino, these are your first generation leptons, which are the most abundant, followed by the muon and its pair, muon neutrino. These are your second generation leptons. These are much rarer and heavier in size compared to the first generation leptons. And finally, the third generation leptons, the tau and the tau neutrino, these are so rare that when we see them, they decay so quickly into the second generation as well as the first generation leptons. The muon is also classified as a lepton, however it is not a, a subatomic particle as it is not found in the atom. Like the electron, the muon is also negatively charged, however it is heavier than the electron. As we said earlier, it is classified as a second generation lepton and it's much much more unstable than the electron. When the muon decays, it will form the first generation lepton, that is the electron. Muons are produced from cosmic radiation. These radiations are found in the background of the universe and are quite abundant in the upper atmospheres of Earth. Two scientists, Anderson and Nedermeyer, applied an external magnetic field to cosmic radiation that they obtained from the atmosphere. And what they saw is that a new particle, now we know as a muon, it was deflected inside this magnetic field. And its deflection trail was very similar to that of the electron, but the radius of curvature was much greater. This diagram is a simplified way of which you can understand the differences in the two particles' path. As we know now, the reason why the muon has a greater radius of path is because it has the same charge, but a heavier mass compared to the electron. Now let's talk about the discovery of the electron neutrino. Beta minus decay was originally thought to produce the electron and the daughter nuclei from the decay of the parent nucleus. However, while the kinetic energy of the electron, that is the beta minus particle, was thought to be constant for decay process, just like the alpha decay, where the kinetic energy of the alpha particle is always constant, of which we use the word monokinetic to describe, this wasn't actually the case for the beta minus particle. Experiments involved the beta minus decay showed that the beta particle or the electron is not monokinetic as the kinetic energy of the electron varies. This discrepancy is shown in the graph on the right hand side. As you can see, the red line shows the distribution of energy levels of various electrons that's emitted from the beta decay of bismuth 210. And what Lots of physicists notice is that no matter what the electron's energy was, there was always this missing amount of energy that was not accounted by the kinetic energy of the electron. The reason for this 
was that the beta minus decay was thought to produce the electron and the daughter nucleus only. However, a person called Pauli proposed that this is not the case. He proposed that the energy difference that we saw in the experiment is attributed to the emission of a very small particle known as the antineutrino. He further said that the energy produced from beta decay is shared between the electron and the antineutrino, such that the combined amount of energy before and after the beta decay will obey the law of conservation of energy. So when the electron has less energy, the antineutrino will have more energy. Vice versa, when the electron has more energy, the antineutrino has less kinetic energy. Due to the antineutrino's much lighter mass, it is often ejected at a higher velocity compared to the electrons. This is due to the law of conservation of momentum. We know that the momentum of the electron should be equal to the momentum of the antineutrino. That is, the magnitude should be equal. So if the mass of the neutrino is much smaller than the mass of the electron, its velocity should be much higher than that of the electron. Since the kinetic energy depends on the square of the velocity, the antineutrino often has much higher kinetic energy compared to the electron. Similar to beta minus decay, beta positive decay also produces two particles in addition to the daughter nucleus, that is a positron and a neutrino. These two particles are antiparticles of the electron and the antineutrino respectively. And the laws of conservation of energy and momentum apply equally in the same way in beta plus decay as in beta minus decay. Interestingly, the mass of neutrinos and antineutrinos are very small, and they are so small we have not yet confirmed the exact number. Quarks are another type of fundamental particles known as fermions. Quarks were first discovered in an experiment called deep inelastic scattering. This experiment involved electrons being fired at high speed at a proton in a particle accelerator. I talk more about particle accelerators, how they work, and the impact in the field of physics in another video. The firing of high speed electrons at a proton results in an inelastic collision. And this inelastic collision results in the transformation of kinetic energy. Specifically, this kinetic energy of the electrons was used to remove a quark from the proton. What they've shown in, th in this experiment was that by colliding these high speed electrons at a proton, a fragment of the proton, now we know as a quark, was effectively removed from the proton. And the main implication of this experiment is that they showed protons are in fact not fundamental particles, as they are made of smaller particles known as quarks. So quarks make up numerous subatomic particles. We talked about protons, and they also make up neutrons. Now, there are a few other terms that we have to discuss and learn in the standard model of matter. Hadrons are particles that consist of quarks. So protons, neutrons, anything that's made of quarks are also known as hadrons. Underneath hadrons, we have two types of hadrons, baryons and mesons. Baryons are particles that are made of exactly three quarks. And mesons are particles that consist of two quarks. Specifically, it is one quark and one antiquark. But we'll talk about this in a moment. Now, in these particles, which are made of quarks, the quarks are glued together by a type of boson that is a force median particle called a gluon. Baryons are subatomic particles made of three quarks. There are again six types of quarks, very similar to the leptons. Up and down quark form the first generation, chum and strange form the second generation, top and bottom form the third generation of quarks. Again, the second and the third generations are much, much more unstable and a lot rarer compared to the first generation. Up, chum and top quarks, each of them has a positive two third of a charge. Whereas down, strange and bottom quarks each has a minus one third of a charge. It is very high yield for you to know the composition of a proton and a neutron. A proton is made of two up quarks and one down quark. The shorthand notation for this is UUD. By having two up quarks, we've got two times positive two third of a charge. 
and by having one down quark, this will contribute minus one third of a charge. If you add these charges together, you'll get a total charge of plus one. This explains why a proton has a positive one charge. On the other hand, a neutron is made of one up quark and two down quarks, U, D, D. One up quark contributes a positive two thirds charge, whereas two down quarks contributes two times minus one third of a charge. If you add these numbers together, you'll get a total net charge of zero. That's why neutrons do not have charges. Mesons are the other type of hadrons, which are made of quarks. Specifically, mesons consist of one quark and one antiquark. The best example to use to understand mesons is using pions. There are three types of pions, positive pions, negative pions, and neutral pions. Positive pions consist of one up quark, which has a positive two-third of a charge, and one anti-down quark. Now remember that a down quark has a minus one third of a charge and an anti-down quark is its anti-particle. So it has the same mass but exactly the opposite charge, so plus one third. By adding these two partial charges together, I get a net charge of positive one. That's why this particular meson is known as a positive pion. The way we denote anti-quarks is by using a horizontal accent symbol above the letter itself. So D with an accent on top is anti-down quark. Negative pions consist of an anti-up quark which contributes a charge of minus two-third and a down quark which has a charge of minus one-third. Again they add up to a total charge of minus one. Neutral pions consist of two different combinations. You can have either an up quark and an anti-up quark or a down quark and an anti-down quark, both of which will give you a net charge of zero. Just like the quarks we saw in protons and neutrons, quarks and antiquarks are also glued together by gluons, which are bosons, and we'll talk about gluons very soon. What you also need to know about quarks is that they have this property called color charges, and these are red, blue, or green. The word color is in inverted commas because the quarks themselves are not actually colored. However, we use the descriptions of colors to categorize this idea of different charges in addition to the positive two-third and the minus one-third of charges for quarks they normally have already. The standard model matter states that the baryons and the mesons must contain a particular combination of color charges of quarks, such that when you mix the quarks' colors together, they must produce a neutral color. As an example, in a baryon such as a proton, when we have two up quarks and one down quark, we must also make sure that the color charges of these three quarks together, they must produce a neutral color. In this case, a red quark, a blue quark, and a green down quark, when added together, will give you a neutral color. The way this works is quite different in mesons, because mesons are made of a quark and an anti-quark. So when the quark has a blue color charge, then the anti-quark must have an anti-blue color charge such that when you add them together, again, you have a neutral color. This is not super important as part of your understanding of the standard model of matter. However, it is a good idea to be aware of the idea of color charges when understanding the combination of quarks to form subatomic particles. So we talked about fermions. Fermions consist of quarks and leptons. And of course, depending on the combination of quarks, we can have baryons, mesons, or just in general, hadrons. Now we'll talk about the force-mediating particles called bosons. 